thank you for the introduction, Giovanni. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, to give this talk. And thank you to all of you for, for uh, joining us today. So um, as Giovanni said, I'll be talking about uh, chaos-based information processing with nanocontact vortex oscillators. And so basically the work I'm presenting today um, is a uh, it's the result of uh, a, a large collaboration in, in France, a part of this um, Chipmunks project that I'm coordinating, uh, which involves uh, people from my lab at the Center for Nanoscience and Nanotechnologies in Palais Zoo. Uh, we've had some collaborations with uh, some people from nonlinear optics uh, in MESS, uh, material scientists in, in Nancy, and uh, our colleagues at the CNRS Talis who've helped out with the nanofabrication of these devices. Okay, so. Um, this is the brief outline of my talk. So I'll give you just a very quick overview of, of what chaos might be used uh, for information processing. I'll describe briefly the nanocontact vortex oscillators that we've been studying. And then I'll talk about a series of low temperature uh, time domain measurements in which we've seen uh, some of these chaotic effects and some more recent work in which we looked into uh, more details of the pattern generation and symbolic dynamics associated with the system. And I'll terminate by giving a very short summary and outlook of, of this work. So, um, so what is what is chaos and, and what is it good for? So perhaps a good starting point would be to consider uh, something that is not chaotic, so a limit cycle oscillator. Uh, so shown here um, is a three-dimensional representation of, of the trajectories of, 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 of such an oscillator, shown in, in blue. And we have to imagine that, let's say, we start this uh, system with 200 uh, starting points, which are closely spaced together. And so if this system is non-chaotic, uh, we see that after a certain time, uh, T prime, uh, all these points uh, converge onto the steady uh, limit cycle, and, and uh, we have uh, you know, some kind of a sinusoidal output, say. Now, we can contrast this to the chaotic system. Um, so, uh, Oops. Uh, shown here. So this is an example for the Russler system. So again, a three-dimensional representation of the phase space. Uh, now, what you'll notice is that if we if we begin this thought experiment, um, uh, did I just draw on my screen? Uh, with, with this initial set of, uh, of points, then um, after a certain time, uh, the, these points kind of disperse uh, out in space. And we are, we are left with, with uh, trajectories that diverge very quickly. And so uh, if we think about what kind of uh, output signal one might get from the system, we have this uh, blue line shown here on the bottom. Now, in terms of information, uh, I think I'm, I'm just drawing on my screen and not doing anything useful. In, ter in terms of information technologies, then if we, if we consider... Try the, arrow, try the arrow to move the slides. No. Yeah, I have. Okay. Yeah, I have been, but it just hasn't worked. That's okay. Um, if, if we look at this, the signal uh, that, that comes out, uh, in, in the case of a limit cycle, we have uh, something that is of minimum information content. So if once we know the frequency and phase, uh, we can predict essentially the future evolution of the system without a problem. Uh, whereas in the chaotic system, we are continually surprised because we're not able to uh, predict what's going to happen next, unless we know these in, in initial conditions to, to very uh, high precision. And so in some sense, the chaotic system uh, has an infinite information content, and it turns out that we can use this uh, in, in different ways. Um, and so uh, one is the um, it's random number generation. So this has been demonstrated in optical systems. So here is an example where uh, the outputs of two chaotic lasers are coupled together. And it's been shown that with some uh, you know, binary operations, one can generate um, uh, random bits at, at rates of exceeding gigabits uh, per second. Um, chaos, synchronized chaos has been used um, to uh, uh, encode uh, information that has been transmitted over um, fiber optic networks. And so this is an, uh, an example from a nature paper in 2006, where uh, the message, as you can see, can be, once it's encoded and, and using a synchronized chaos, that looks a lot like noise, uh, but this can be decoded with a chaotic oscillator on, on the receiving end. And you can see- Sorry, sorry, some... sorry, John, yeah. you just see the first slide. So the presentation is not, is not going ahead. 
Oh, really? Yeah. So we are still uh, in the non-caudic system with the cycle of Silesia. Okay. Um, uh, let me let me try sharing differently then. Yeah. Uh, I apologize for this issue. So if I just, I'll share my desktop. Okay, can you see? Uh, what slide can you see now? Is this okay? Random number generation. Perfect, so, um, so this is, uh, so let me just go quickly So. This is the example of the random number generation uh, where you, you couple these chaotic oscillators, uh, lasers together and you, you, you apply a binary uh, operation. You get these, these high uh, gigabit uh, per second type generation rates. Uh, this was uh, what I mentioned about um, encoding uh, messages in, in using a synchronized chaos to, to, you know, uh, as a means of having secure communications. And um, there are even some proposals to do, uh, you know, more kind of crazy morphing logic gates where a single dynamical system can morph between different logical operations and one can imagine some form of a new uh, computing architecture based on such systems. Um, so how does one generate chaos in, in Spintronics? So I've given here a number of uh, recent uh, proposals on this. So uh, one is uh, using a coupled um, magnetization dynamics in a spin torque type system. So Slomczewski windmills. So in this case, when you apply a current through this uh, bilayer structure, the mutual spin torque uh, results in a complicated dynamics for M1 and M2, magnetization of the two layers, and one can generate chaos that way. Uh, we've shown recently that if you uh, apply a time delay feedback into a simple oscillatory system, uh, one can also uh, get chaos for certain ampli ampli amplification and, and delay times. And chaos has also been seen uh, in, in switching processes when you, uh, when you apply RF uh, spin talks, for example. Uh, but the, the system I want to talk about uh, today is the nanocontact vortex oscillator, and, and this is a schematic of, of how this works. So we imagine a, a multi-layered system, let's say a spin valve, uh, through which a large current density is applied through a metallic nanocontact. Uh, this current generates a Nernstein ampere field, uh, which favors the, the, the nucleation of a vortex, and the spin torques then drive this vortex around this nanocontact. And so, um, so you can see here, uh, schematized uh, positions of the vortex around the nanocontact. And because you have a giant magneto resistant signal, for example, this translates into an oscillatory signal uh, in real time. But if you look at this in the frequency domain, you would, should see well-defined uh, spectral peaks. And so we, uh, we've done a lot of studies on, on this uh, system shown here on the right. Uh, and so this is, uh, represents a spin valve where we have a 20 nanometer thick permoy layer uh, with a cobalt uh, uh, reference layer. And the specific feature here is that the nanocontacts can be down to about 20 nanometers uh, in, in diameter. And this is done with a uh, AFM nano indentation uh, technique that's been perfected by our colleagues at uh, Sinas Talis. Okay, so uh, when we look at these uh, nanocontact systems, um, so this is something that we started uh, quite some time ago. Uh, this is an example of some of the resulting uh, power spectrum as a function of applied current. And so you can see there are a lot of um, different uh, uh, spectral lines that are present, uh, uh, indicating a qu quite a rich uh, dynamical behavior. So but we can break this down into two uh, typical kind of regime. So one is just a pure gyration regime where the vortex just orbits the nanocontact um, with an elliptical shape. And so this generates a lot of harmonics. And there's a second regime here where we see a lot of different uh, spectral lines that appear. And this is where the gyration is accompanied by some form of modulation. So you can see uh, on the bottom uh, in green, this um, uh, PSD is now accompanied by a number of uh, modulation sidebands. And, and so uh, as we drive the current up, uh, we see additional modulation taking place in the system. And so uh, we've done simulations to, to understand uh, what uh, drives such modulations. And it turns out there is this uh, process called periodic core reversal. 
and, and so, um, so this is a snapshot of what you see from simulation. So we see uh, the vortex is indeed being driven around this nanocontact, uh, but from time to time, uh, once the vortex reaches some kind of critical deformation, as seen here, the core switches polarity and the gyration proceeds in the opposite sense. And so this adds an additional modulation to the system. And, and so we're now coupling uh, gyration with an additional relaxation oscillation on top. Okay. So, so how does chaos appear then in the system? So we have two essentially competing frequencies. So one given by the gyration. So let's call this uh, F0. So uh, shown schematically here in red. And we have on top an additional relaxation oscillation. So this is basically the, the core uh, reversing. And this uh, is schematized in blue here. So this is really like an energy that's charging up and then discharging after some threshold is reached. And so when we have these two frequencies to compete, then we are getting close to uh, what people study in commensurate, in commensurate phase transitions, where we have to kind of match two different, two distinct frequencies. And so uh, this can be characterized by the ratio between these two characteristic uh, frequencies. So let's call this F mod over F. And so if this is a rational uh, of our integer fraction, then we may have a commensurate state. So if we have, let's say one core reversal for every two orbits, we would get this uh, commensurate kind of pattern here on top. Whereas if this fraction is irrational, then we would have an incommensurate state, and in which case, uh, where that core reversal process takes place uh, may not necessarily be predictable. And so indeed, when we look at the simulated power spectrum for uh, a rational and irrational case, so here, uh, a commensurate state of two over five, we see some very well-defined spectral peaks, uh, whereas in the um, irrational incommensurate state, we see some large broadening of the peaks, and this is in simulation where no um, temperature is taken into account. So, but this is indicative of some chaotic process going on. And so these were, you know, reason, results from micromagnetics that we'd had for some time. And we revisited this system uh, more recently in low temperature measurements to, to look for these chaotic signals in our, in our experimental device. And so it's important to look at it in, in low temperatures uh, because chaos does look like thermal noise, but it is an athermal, or an athermal origin. Uh, so it's, it's best to, to minimize the real thermal uh, fluctuations as much as possible. So this is just a comparison between uh, two PSD maps taken at room temperature and one taken at liquid nitrogen temperatures. And you can see that at 77 Kelvin, uh, we see a, a lot finer details uh, present in the power spectrum and, and some very large power regions that, uh, that are indicative of chaos. And so we, we looked um, at, at, at this in more detail at, at low temperatures. And so here's an example of what you can do to this oscillator. So you, you apply a, cur uh, a constant current and you can sweep the, the applied uh, perpendicular magnetic field, for example. And by doing so, you can control the transitions between something that looks quite uh, ordered and commensurate. So uh, regions uh, where we have well-defined uh, lines with the central region uh, where there's a lot more power and, and the spectra looks a lot noisier. And so if we look at uh, a line cut here uh, shown by this black triangle, indeed we see some broadish uh, spectral lines. We compare that to a cut taken here shown by the red triangle. We have some very, uh, very fine spectral lines. So this uh, is suggestive that in one case, we have some kind of a well-defined gyration dynamics and in the other, something that looks a lot like chaos. And, and this is confirmed when we look at the spectral line width, we have a clear uh, regime where we have a, a very low line width compared to one where it's been larger. So shown here in the blue uh, circles. And this broadening is again, consistent with a thermal noise. And if we look at this commensurability parameter, so the ratio between the modulation frequency and the gyration frequency, we see something that's quite stable outside of this uh, region here uh, where we have broad spectral alignment. So again, this is suggestive that we have a chaos in this particular region. Um, and so to, to, to go a bit further, we can look at the experimental time traces. So here are examples of the time traces in these two regions, one commensurate, the other incommensurate. And, um, and, and typically uh, one of the kind of um, first things you can do is to, 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 to calculate something called a Lyapunov exponent. 
and so uh, given here by lambda. And so basically this exponent, it gives you a measure of how quickly paths uh, emanating from similar initial conditions diverge. Okay. And so here schematically shown two directories. And so you have them some separation as a function of time delta. And, and if you say, well, this is proportional to some exponential uh, function of time with some parameter lambda, then the lambda is an estimate of your Lyapunov exponent. And so this is uh, the result of the analysis is shown on the bottom here. So using two different uh, algorithms to compute this exponent, the Wolf and the Rosenstein algorithms. And so you can see that um, there is a slight a step a little difference uh, in the field region in which we, we, we see these uh, large uh, spectral peaks. But you'll notice that the exponent's actually positive everywhere. And, and, and this we attribute to the fact that we have uh, thermal noise present in the system. So naturally, your system would diverge after, after some finite time. And so ultimately, you know, the, the presence of noise uh, leads to some positive uh, exponents everywhere. So this measure is actually quite inconclusive. And to get around that, we tried a different technique, which is called the titration of chaos without a noise. And basically, this is a, a numerical titration technique where you say, well, okay, I have my time trace. And progressively, I'm going to add white noise of increasing standard deviations until whatever nonlinearity is present in the system uh, goes undetected. And so this defines some form of noise limit. And so when we apply this uh, technique to our time traces, we see uh, this result here on the bottom right, uh, where in the commensurate state, we have uh, a noise limit very close to zero, indicating a very uh, well, a li linear kind of a response. Whereas in the, uh, in the incommensurate or broad spectra state, we have a very large uh, noise limit. And so that again is suggestive of, of chaos. And so this uh, gives an even clearer indication that we have uh, of chaos uh, in these uh, time traces. And so um, that brings to the question of, of, of patterns. So uh, are we, can, can we learn something about the patterns that are generated uh, both in the commensurate and, and chaotic states? And so I said that our, these traces, these time traces are a little noisy. Uh, but when we looked at the order correlation function of such time traces, we noticed that uh, we have some patterns that actually uh, come out quite clearly. So perhaps it's not so clear in the incommensurate case, but certainly in the commensurate case, as shown by these green uh, curve on the bottom here, we see uh, alternations of a large and a small peak. Okay? And so this would indicate, for example, perhaps a, um, a core reversal every, every gyration. And so we wondered, would it be possible to, to, to apply some kind of a filtering uh, to our data to, to explore or to highlight uh, the kind of patterns we would have in our oscillators? And to do that, we, 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 look, we uh, adopted this following approach. So we, we used uh, what we call a pattern a kernel uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to try to average the noise. So we identify by eye, for example, an orange region here. So this is a waveform that appears to repeat periodically. And we use that as a kernel. And then we take another test segment of the same duration shown in blue. And we time shift them together. Okay? And then we perform a, a, a convolution of these two signals. Okay? So once we do that, we get the, 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 uh, the, the, the plot on the bottom. And so but the idea is that if the two segments match up, then we have something large that comes out of the convolution. Otherwise, it's something that's small and oscillates around zero. And so once we take uh, this approach with this given kernel, we see that um, at four instances in this window shown by the orange circles, we have a match between the orange test kernel and our full time trace. And so we can do this repeatedly for the time traces. And this is what you see. So um, you can identify all the instances uh, where such a pattern uh, takes place. And this orange overlaid curve here gives you the average uh, pattern that comes out of this uh, averaging technique. And so now what we can do is we can, we can apply this technique to all the different patterns we identify to smooth out the time traces. So uh, this is, uh, what we did. And, and so here is just the PhD of the, of the, of the region of interest. So this is a, a separate experiment where we did a variation uh, of, the, of the DC current so we can identify a transition between uh, a commensurate 
to an incommensurate state. And so if we first look at the applied current at 2.6 milliamps, which is in the commensurate state, we see the time average, the pattern average uh, signal that is shown here. So we see a signal that is quite clean and that is punctuated with a number of cusps. So this is shown in the, in the gray dot here. And so if we look at, at our simulations, uh, we note that, for example, if the core does one, uh, one orbits in a counterclockwise fashion, it might generate the orange uh, time signal, whereas if it is executes a clockwise gyration, it might um, generate something like the blue signal. And so if you have a switching between up to down or down to up, you would see uh, cusps of this sort. So we identify then uh, these cusps uh, shown in the gray circles as core reversal events. So we can do this to uh, the other, uh, at the other current that, that we, we, uh, we studied. So this is shown on top here. So uh, two commensurate states at 12.6 and at 14 milliamps and one a chaotic state at 13.2 at milliamps. So you can see that through this pattern filtering technique, uh, we are able to uh, get rid of most of the noise in the system and really be able to focus on, on the form of the, uh, of the oscillation patterns. And as you can see for the commensurate state, at 40 milliamps, we, we, we see this very well reproduced uh, repeating uh, motif, uh, whereas in the chaotic state, it is not so clear uh, what is going on. And so um, what we can do now, we, we can count uh, basically the number of, uh, we can estimate the number of gyrations required between uh, core reversal. So we, we go back to this uh, time filtered, uh, filtered time trace here, and, and we have all these uh, cusps identified in the gray circles, and then we can just basically estimate the number of uh, gyrations required between reversals. And so this is plotted on the bottom here, shown by n. So n basically tells you the number of gyrations between reversals. So in this particular case, we have two gyrations uh, for every core reversal. And so if we obtain this analysis um, for the other cases of interest, we see for the other commensurate case of 14 uh, milliamps, it alternates between one and two. Uh, whereas for the chaotic state at the center, uh, there does not appear to be any long term. Although I show a very short uh, uh, ex you know, sequence here, there does not appear to be any long term pattern in a number of core reversals, uh, a number of gyrations between core reversals. So, based on the number of gyrations and based on the core polarity, then we can say, well, we have uh, these four patterns. Uh, possible. So uh, either you do one or two gyrations depend and for up and down polarities. And so now we can interpret uh, our time signals in this way. So for one uh, state at 12.6, we have an alternance between the yellow and orange type of behavior. The other commensurate state, an alternance between blue and orange. And for chaos, we really have a mix of, of, of all these different, um, uh, of all the different type of patterns. And so this is a way to get uh, some uh, information about uh, the possible patterns that can be generated by this uh, oscillator. And so now what we can try to do is to reconstruct the um, uh, three-dimensional phase space uh, related to this, uh, related to this uh, system. And we do that by using a time delay technique. So basically what you do is you take your signal and you apply a time delay uh, to the signal to obtain your different, uh, your higher dimensional coordinates. So here X2 is the, your signal shifted by one time delay of tau, and X3 is your signal shifted by two time delays. And if you choose uh, your time delay to be, for example, a quarter period, uh, then that allows you to get some, uh, a nice representation of your uh, oscillation. So you can think about this, you know, if you just had a very simple cosine oscillation and you just shifted this by a quarter period, then you would get the equivalent, uh, you know, your, your sine function. And of course, uh, this would describe uh, immediately the, um, the dynamics on a unit circle. And so this is exactly what we try to do with our experimental time traces. And so this is the attractor that you see when we reconstruct it this way. You can see that uh, it is a, uh, a closed, um, you know, uh, uh, periodic, kind of uh, uh, attractive, but from time to time, it, when you see uh, in the chaotic state, we see some, um, some fractal um, nature to it, but this is 
uh, this is one way to get an idea of this three-dimensional representation. And so um, you can use this three-dimensional representation uh, to get something uh, uh, known as the symbolic dynamic. So basically this is boiling the system down uh, in an information theoretic terms to what uh, the dynamics, uh, you know, how to encode the dynamics with just very simple symbols. So what you do is you take this three-dimensional phase space and you take a, you take a surface in this, in this system called a Poincaré section. And, and you, look at, you, you look at the instances at which the trajectories cross the section. So this is shown on the bottom here. And every time the trajectories cross the section, it's represented by a, a dot. So uh, the black dots basically indicate uh, regions where the trajectories cross the section the most, but you see some gray areas, which represents that, well, from time to time, it, it crosses at a different point. And on this uh, section here, you can define a partition function to split the, 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 the phase space into two, let's call this A and B. And now let's just count or uh, note every time the, the system passes through A or B, okay? And so this is a way to generate symbols based on the system. Um, so you can do the same thing for the chaotic case and for the other commensurate case. So these are the uh, Poincaré sections uh, corresponding to that. And so what does that look like? So um, look on the bottom here is, is I plotted out the sequences of A's and B's that come about when you do this analysis, the symbolic dynamics analysis. And we realize that the, the, the sequences are actually defined by a very simple rule. So shown on the bottom. So we have three A's it gets, and then three B's and then three A's. So this is uh, a cycle that repeats itself. And so by symbolic dynamics, uh, the, the, uh, the assertion here is that once we have the rules, of the system, we can basically, um, uh, I mean, this describes the essence of the dynamics of, of this commensurate state. Uh, we do the same thing for the other commensurate state at 14 milliamps. We see a slightly different rule. So it's one A followed by three Bs. And when we look at the chaotic system, then uh, we actually see uh, something that's slightly more complicated, but nevertheless can be described in terms of these two basic rules. So either the system does three A's and then three B's, so the rules on the left, or it does one A followed by three B's, otherwise the rule on the right. And so it turns out that the chaotic system is really just alternating in some unpredictable way between these two different rules. Okay. So we can see the ultimate, the, the final rule at the bottom at the center. So the system either goes, takes the left rule or the right rule. So therefore we can use these rules as a way to encode information. So let's encode uh, the rule on the left as zero, the rule on the right as one. And therefore the chaotic system would therefore represent just some unpredictable transition between zero and one. And so if you plot this out, uh, this is what it looks like. So in one commensurate state, we have just a sequence of zeros because the rule does not change. Similar for the other, the sequence of ones. And in a chaotic state, we see this transition uh, between zeros and ones. And so again, in a commensurate state, we have no surprises. So once we know what the rule is, that's exactly what the system obeys. Uh, but in the chaotic state, we have infinite surprises because whether it transitions to one or zero is unpredictable. And so we can characterize the degree to which we have zeros or ones. And so this is plotted in this graph here. So we plot the probability as a function of applied current. Uh, in the chaotic region is indicated in orange. And then we can see that there's a very smooth transition in probability uh, uh, between the two uh, extremities where about a 50-50 probability uh, somewhere in the middle of that. And we can also look at some um, Markov chain kind of an analysis, basically, which basically asks the question, if I have a zero, then what is the probability that I have a one or a zero? So, you know, how much memory there is in the system? Um, and it, it turns out that uh, also somewhere in the middle, uh, these probabilities also uh, approach 50%, although they don't quite um, uh, match up uh, very well. But nevertheless, it gives you an indication of how, how good of a, of a random number generator this system might be. 
And one of the final things that we did was to look at the complexity of the, of the signals that came out of this uh, oscillator. So uh, something called a block entropy. And so basically, so now you have the sequences of bits and, and so you can take uh, some certain number of them. So let's say, look at the two bit sequence, for example. So we would have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And then we can ask the question, how likely is each member of the sequence uh, of the bits uh, family uh, appear? How likely, I know, do they appear with equal likelihood? And, and it turns out that um, in the chaotic region, at least at the center, we have this a maximum in the block entropy rate. So basically this tells you that uh, most of these members are equally probable. So if you brought this to a, a coin toss and you have um, as many heads as tails. <clears throat> uh, and the, the final measure of, of complexity we looked at was the sample zip uh, measure of complexity. So basically just tells you that uh, how complex is your system. So for example, if you had um, uh, four letters, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, and they just repeated an infinitum, that is not a very complex signal. But whereas if you had some uh, other combination that you could not predict, shown here as A, D, B, C, D, C, C, A, for example, that is more complex. And so again, if we look at the chaotic region of this oscillator, we have a maximum in the complexity. And so that again indicates that we have uh, something that is, that is uh, quite uh, chaotic in this, in this region here. Okay, so um, I think that's all I wanted to say. So uh, I talked about uh, nanocontact vortex oscillators and some recent work that we did to look at low temperature uh, time series data where we uh, brought to light some of the chaotic uh, characteristics of some of these time series by looking at titration with noise, for example. And I also talked about how uh, one could use a pattern filtering technique to look at the symbolic dynamics and, and really look at the complexity of the signals that, that can come out of such systems. And so I've mentioned random number generation a number of times uh, during this talk. So this is an obvious um, uh, you know, a step forward for, for such systems. And of course, in spintronics, uh, there've been a lot of uh, attempts to, to kind of you know, uh, use, for example, super pragmatic uh, magnetic tunnel junctions as, as random number generators, and these work quite well, of course. Uh, so here's an example from the recent literature where uh, you, know, you, can, you can definitely generate um, uh, random numbers with no problems. But um, the problem with, with thermal uh, type systems is that they tend to be quite slow. And so in the example cited on the top here, the generation rate can be about maybe one megabit uh, per second, but certainly scalable because you can put a lot of these uh, together. Uh, from with the chaotic system that uh, I've shown here, we can uh, get rates that are much higher, so for about 100 megabits per second. And so hopefully uh, this might encourage, you know, uh, those in spintronics and in magnetization dynamics to perhaps think about uh, how their systems could be used for such applications, which I think would be uh, quite interesting to explore. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.